Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. Hey everybody, this is Janice, and we're in St. Louis again. I love doing shows locally. I sometimes have problems connecting them directly to farming, so you know, I get creative. Today we are at a place that I don't know how many St. Louisans knew about. It's in the Central West End. It's called Bowood, and it is a strange property, I gotta say. It's not very many places like this in this part of the world, maybe. Maybe out west, I don't know. But we're going to be talking to Zane Darren, and Zane is the executive chef here at Bowood by Niche. Correct. Bowood and Bowood by Niche are two separate things Correct. intertwined in weird ways. Mm-hmm. So he's the executive chef. We're going to be talking all about food and fresh and seasonal and all those great things. So why don't we explain why I say Bowood and Bowood by Niche is a strange experience compared to most restaurants? Mm-hmm. Or most garden centers. Yeah, I would say probably a little bit of both. Uh, so here we have Bowood by Niche within Bowood Nursery. Uh, in two, I think Gerard acquired it in uh, 2020 when it used to be Cafe Osage. So the mm. parents of the current owners, or the dad of the current owners now, had a little cafe in here and all that jazz. But now we've acquired it, and it's Bowood by Niche. Um, we are located inside of a nursery. We have... The inside kitchen and restaurant, you dine inside of the greenhouse where you buy plants and all that stuff. And now we have this beautiful outdoor patio that's literally inside of the nursery or the outer walls. Yeah. You can, you're amongst the birds, the bees, the flies, the plants, the gravel, the smells, the textures, the. People are going to want to watch the video, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, it's it's absolutely wild. Uh, One of the driving forces of me moving up to St. Louis to continue my working with Gerard and uh, Niche Food Group was to work at this location. Yeah. So it's a unique spot. Like once you're in these four walls, you honestly, I don't think that I'm in St. Louis. You know, I compare it to more like an Italian villa or the French countryside or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're in the middle of a major city, more or less, you know, inside of a, I don't know, a restaurant at all, (laughs) to be honest with you. And like the best way possible. (laughs) Yeah, a chef who doesn't want to work in a restaurant. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting dilemma. So let me <laughs> um, let me provide a little background on my view of Gerard and the Niche Group because I've really seen it grow from what was like one restaurant. I remember Niche in Benton Park. It was a pretty high end restaurant, I would say. He was still relatively undiscovered. He's now won multiple James Beard awards. Like it seems unbelievable how often he's in it and he has an incredible group of people that are all together working on different specific things here in st louis is it six eight restaurants eight i think he's at eight probably eight. going on a little more yeah yeah and each of them are very accessible to regular people niche has lived through its lifespan as a restaurant it might come back there was there's a couple of dishes i'll put on the list if we get those you know at some point gerard call me um (laughs) (laughs) but really it is one of those amazing things where the right chef found the right city and he's found ways to grow that very much fit this area Mm -hmm. and also grow our culinary scene Mm -hmm. significantly is that what you've seen very accurate okay yeah all right, so tell me, how did you get started in food? Like where, like your early beginnings, what made you think, I really love food, this is a place for me, this is a way I like to engage with food, or whatever it is? Uh, so for me, like the beginning parts of what drives me to want to be in the culinary industry or hospitality would definitely stem from my immediate family. So my mom's side of the family is Italian, so this little... <laughs> little town called Tawny Town in uh, Northwest Arkansas, right outside of Springdale and Bentonville, Arkansas, that most people know now, or Fayetteville. It was all about, like, on the weekends, gathering. So our family was 30, 35 people with the cousins, everybody included. A lot of weekends to where we would spend out there on the like farm. grandmoms. Yeah, at Bobby's, what we call her, grandma. <laughs> um, sent out there cooking all day long. You know, we would usually start the day before. So the pasta or the polenta, whatever gravy or red sauce we were making. Glad you're calling it gravy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, if it was the squirrels that we hunted, the rabbit, or if it was beef or chicken, whatever we had laying around that we could make into it is what we did. But the camaraderie and the loudness of (laughs) 
the <laughs> everybody there, the energy that you felt as soon as you showed up was astronomical. And it was something that I always looked forward to as a kid. Yep. And something that as I got older and as the family grew, we stopped doing a lot of, and we, we missed a lot of it. Like we, I started missing that. Yeah. And so growing up and then like starting to think about what I was going to do the rest of my life, it kind of was like, I, you know, had to sit and think like, what do I want to do? What makes me happy? And all the time, every single time, every thought ended, well, I was always happiest at these moments. So lead myself to here like how do i get those how do how i get that how can you feeling? make that yeah. happen on the weekly basis yes and so it was <laughs> being a chef didn't know that's what i wanted to do i for sure couldn't boil water before <laughs> i started cooking like it was craft macaroni and cheese was the pinnacle of my culinary existence before culinary school besides stirring the pot of polenta or the the gravy and anything stuff with, somebody else had cooked you could stir it oh i i could nail that yeah i was i was the stirrer in the family you give me a big pot of polenta, I'd stir that sucker for eight hours nonstop if I had to. <laughs> yeah, it became mechanical. The reward yeah. of the polenta meant, meant you yeah, could stir. Yeah, exactly. So I knew I got to eat it at the other end of the tunnel. And the homemade <laughs> ice cream machines, I was the guy that had to sit there and crank it. Yeah. I was just a little workhorse, but it's okay. Yeah. So one of the things that really surprised me, you said you went and were fishing for the summer in Alaska when you were a teenager? Yes. So as a gift... Uh, as a birthday gift, uh, one of my dad's business partners, uh, Howard Sanders, he went up there in the 70s, acquired property, fishing rights, and all that stuff that you had to do. Um, so growing up, he always told me, or my dad, like, hey, when Zane turns 16, I'm going to take him up here that summer. We're going to get him a, a license. We're going to get him the permit, all that stuff, set him up, and he's going to go. He passed right before that summer, but his son Brian took me up there, and it was instant love, right? Hardest thing I've ever done in my life scariest thing for my mother to let her <laughs> 16 year old go up to alaska and start fishing with some grown men and stranger things like that yeah you know nobody goes to alaska because we've, we've it's watched calm. the deadliest yeah catch. you know it's full of some unwanted people but it was awesome you know it's a life experience um so that was you know that kind of set in stone like what it meant to be a part of food greater than the grocery store okay like that started my love and my affection for farming food for production the, yeah, food and production as a whole like yeah. what does it mean because like it's easy to go to a store and buy something in a plastic wrapper open it and not know where it came from not even know that it has a head that it has gills that it had a heartbeat or whatever you're into if right. it was in soil and it had roots all that stuff like i didn't understand that growing up because i just knew it was around right right um but knowing that the hard work and the the lives the danger the amount of money the effort that people put into this stuff was the, a reward for me to understand what that meant yeah. to bring the food to the table. Yeah. And that was kind of like the first stepping stone of my career. I mean, like it's hard work. That. Oh, absolutely. Staying up for four or five, six days at a time, no sleep. You're out there in big waves. You're out there getting chased down by grizzlies. That did happen one time. <laughs> Unreal stuff. Like, you can't write a book about it. Like, you know, you see the Deadly Sketch. You're, that's pretty spot on. Like, it is not for the weary. It's not for the faint heart. But it's one of those things, once you commit to it, you have to do it. If not, you're going to be eaten up by something. <laughs> if it's your people on the boat with you, a bear, whatever. Like, something's going to happen and it ain't going to be good. Mom's going to be upset. You but, carry your weight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. So, your culinary tour you got out of, like, a, a quick version. We yeah. don't have to go in detail. Yeah. But what are some of the things, after you finally went to culinary school, you finally figured maybe this is it? Yeah, so culinary school in Seattle kind of solidified all right this is the I'm, no going back now you spent some money on it you spent time you bought the right it. knives yeah you know whatever. that was all things i learned but what i realized after that was like all right i wanted to do live fire i wanted to do something that involved live fire cooking like a caveman renaissance-esque because i believe in work with your hands to quiet your mind kind of thing and then i also what also was important was to be honest was the farming like where is my food coming from that i'm about to feed people even from my line cook like Although I wasn't in charge of a menu, I wasn't in charge of anything besides my station. Yeah. It was very important to know what was being on my station and where we're getting it from. Yeah. You know, like, do I cut it the right way? Do I make sure that I don't, I'm not serving something that's old or expired or making sure that we're using the product before it gets to that point. Yeah. So that way the time is not lost on these farmers. Yeah. We paid for the product. It's ours now. They the don't have to worry about it. Is an but issue. it's also like treating with respect to what they do. Like it was yeah. important for me to find those restaurants. So that would be the Hive in Bentonville at 21C, Gray and Dudley at 21C in Nashville, Husk Nashville for Sean Brock. And then finally to now, I think is my last 
hoorah with a restaurant group before I open something on my own. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, I hope it lasts for a lot longer. Is what Gerard crafted niche food group. Honestly, is the pinnacle of that bringing like proof is in the pudding here in St. Louis wasn't on the map, but he knew that there was something here. He knew that the food was here. He knew the farming was here. He just had to get people excited about it. And to see somebody do that is like what I want to do with my story in my life. So what better way to learn than from him? So the next the next step after Bowood, you, you think, or somewhere else in the niche group, maybe. You're going to open something yourself? You have yeah. that vision already? The, the plan and the, and the motions are there Like as far as like my thinking process, writing down this stuff, taking all the goods and bads I've learned from all the restaurants yeah. prior. You know, it'd be amazing if Gerard is a part of it, but you know that that's not always the yeah. case. He has his own plan and his own things, and I hope I'm around to see a lot of his plans through yeah. and help him succeed because it's amazing to see. But yeah, I definitely have something in, in mind, and I would love for it to be in Arkansas back home with my family so they can kind of reap the rewards of my hard work and see what's going on. Yeah. And and be a part of that farming scene. Do that, that Sunday culture. dinner again. Yeah. Absolutely. That's cool. Bring that that's back. That's a pretty cool yeah. idea. Share that love and that, 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 that feeling you get smelling the food and hearing all the loud conversation going on. Yeah, I love it. Transcend into time. I love it. So help me understand how you connect the food production side and stuff here at Bowood. The connection uh, as far as like food and what we do is on a weekly basis talking to our farmers that we have access to Mm -hmm. that are growing things for us. Making sure that, so right now we're using like Farmstead and Eat Here and a few other farms uh, that we have single-handed growing like okra and peppers for continuing the conversations with them so that they we they aren't growing things that nobody's using they're growing right. stuff that we need we use black hawk farms out of kentucky for our beef solely mm-hmm. you know they're black angus and a5 american wagyu yeah only ones in the country doing that so we have access to that understanding like what cuts they're available like making sure we're using that um just overall the availability and not in doing what's in season for the farmers and not going out of their realm right so the seasonality like if they're not able to grow tomatoes then we're not using tomatoes if they're growing really gorgeous okra we're gonna gonna find a way to use it yeah like it's understanding where they're at and what's best for them and their land and then being able to translate that into our menu and it's so far it seemed to be going over very well so does that sometimes get complicated though because like summers don't always go as expected right like weather and people can't get anything planted yeah so i mean this past year you know this is my first basically farming season in the midwest yeah you know we had the drought we had a bit of a flooding so the crops were very high and low high and low high and low yeah. so the consistency factor is always is the main factor like it's it what are we going to be able to get on a consistent basis because that is the goal at the end of the day in a restaurant is consistency and i believe that to be true with farming as well like they're trying to grow the most consistent crops yeah. day after day and harvest after week after week. Yep. So that being being flexible in that is like if their harvest isn't great, like how at that point, all right, where are we going outside of them to subsidize some of the product that we're getting? Because you don't necessarily want to turn your menu over every single day as, as awesome yeah. as that sounds because you're not going <laughs> to, you, you may not have the guest return or you may not have the satisfaction right. every day, the consistency. Yeah, you want all doing the time. a seasonal menu. What all goes into that then? Uh, seasonality is well. I mean, obviously within certain month periods of growing seasons, it goes into discussion with the farmers. Like so, what we're doing now, we're not really talking about now. We're talking about what are they about to start growing and harvesting in November. You're December. talking to people like me on social media about what yes. you're doing now. For, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's a team effort. It's not right. just the farmers. It's like, what are you experiencing <laughs> out there in the real world? What is the next person experience like yeah. who are they visiting who are they talking to so it's about a group collective conversation about where we're at how do we get there constant revolving door of ingredients yeah but making sure like so say if we're having trout on the dish like what's the next step versus like what our trout set is now like yeah. how do we incorporate the same farmers and what they're going to go to next like how do we stay relevant in that i have to tell you the tomato season was blowing up at Bowood yes. this year. <laughs> yeah, it did. It came in hard and it came in fast. Uh, one, I think one of the biggest takeaways was most people have never had a tomato sandwich up here, which blew my mind. Which is so weird to yes, me. right? Just plain brioche, white bread, 
Duke's mayonnaise, tomato, salt, and pepper, and you're done. And it it literally took it. It took it took Central little, West in by storm, and I liked it. Getting a little southern in the yeah, house. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> right? Like St. Louis ain't far from south. No, it's not. We're just like very minusculely yeah. t- taken away from it. But yeah, yeah it's uh, it was great to see. Like, and just the simplicity of that, right? So the farmer's growing a really great tomato. Mm-hmm. Putting all the effort into the seeds that they are planting, the variety they're planting, where it's planted, what's growing next to it. Yeah, taking that and putting it on a plate with nothing, nothing more than some mulled on salt, vinegar, and oil, and root uh, the herbs that we're growing here yeah. at the nursery or at the restaurant. That's all we're doing to it. It's yeah. nothing, nothing crazy, but it's taking what people at the perfect time at the perfect place and putting it in the perfect moment for people to enjoy. You know, yeah. it's, it's easy to overcomplicate things, but it's very hard to keep things simple and delicious. So when you bring something in seasonally, how long does the season usually last? Like, is there a typical um, two so months? One would hopefully, you know, like that would be a good. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. But, you know, it's wild up here. The tomato season that happens in the Midwest is much longer and later than it is in the South. Like the South, it's. You get about June, July, and that's about it. Here, and it's too hot. Yeah, and all of a sudden, up here is like we had them in June, and we still have them. We're, which it's faded off our menu now because we're coming into later yeah. part of the season. But like for peaches up here, you know, peaches down there were a lot earlier. Yeah, but they're a lot later up here. But the window up here was very short for peaches because we had the cold, the wind, the <laughs> rain, the hail, and it destroyed the crop. So now you have you build this peach waffle, the peach. <laughs> Desserts, all these things with peaches on it, peach vinegars, yeah. peach panzanella. Like you're growing, you're planting all these things around peach this. Peach crazy. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, a storm comes through, hail damage. All right, now what are we doing instead of that? You know, yeah. that was a short window. Now we're into plums and stone, like nectarines. And now we're already on the butt end of that. So now we're <laughs> thinking about apples. Apples. Right now we just got a good <laughs> load of gala apples, Jonathan apples from Eckert's and then Farmstead Foods next across the river. Yeah squash fall squash we're getting in the cinderellas delicatas butternut acorn all those sweet sugary yeah uh roastable yeah pureable raw applications that you can have with that like that's where we're headed to now plums uh grapes are still we have a few weeks left of grapes purple seedless grapes yeah so people who've never been to this restaurant Mm -hmm. What what are some of the kinds of offerings you guys have? I mean, I, I can tell you what I eat here, but. I think the biggest surprise and the most uh, welcoming thing that we do is our variety of vegetarian and vegan options. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a Southern guy at heart, born and raised. We'll cook the crap out of chicken, pigs, and all. I could see you eating some beef. bacon. Yeah, like all that. I love that. <laughs> I, I adore it. But, you know, it the idea of. Like, we're in the middle of flowers and plants and yeah. all the things that you can buy. So, to take that aspect of things and put it onto the menu in vegetable form has been the greatest accomplishment. Not every meal has to be meat-centered. No, absolutely not. Like, right now, our biggest, one of our biggest sellers and people that are excited about is our vegan cauliflower entree at night. It's just a simple white bean hummus, a whole half a head of cauliflower that's been roasted in African spices. Oh, yeah. Topped with pickled raisins. Uh, salsa verde and some fried chickpeas. It's meaty. It's vegetarian. It's vegan. It hits all the spots. It's spicy. It's not. I was gonna say it's, it's got good flavor to yeah. it. Yeah, like so things like that that we're that we operate on and do on a daily basis is kind of like the surprise factor I think here because yeah. like you can go anywhere right now and get a steak. You can go anywhere and get a chicken breast. You can go anywhere yeah. and get this stuff, but like you can't go everywhere and get a good vegan or vegetarian dish that's composed but you have a few things on the menu folks could get other places so if somebody's not as food adventurous yeah. they could so, they could certainly find things like today i just had a burger because i was really hungry and i needed the meat i think <laughs> yeah. i needed red meat maybe absolutely because it just something just really stung me on it hey, but it's not an over, overly but done there's, burger either oh it's really well oh it's, it's just, put together just with the right proportions of things right. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is this great mixture of things. So mm. it can pull you out of like your food comfort zone. Yes. If that, you're willing to go. Yeah. So right? absolutely. That's one thing that we talked about with like the chef team here and with Gerard. It's like, what can we build that mm-hmm. is people are 
that they know, mm-hmm. that they are safe with, that they are welcome. Like, they like, all right, I can go there. I can get a chicken chicken breast, and I know it's going to be good every time. But if I'm feeling adventurous, they have those options. Yeah. Like, they – The but brunch I know, menu really yeah. gets exciting. Oh, it is. Like, you know, like it's one of the things that we've kind of toned back a little bit on to focus on the consistency part of things. But we've hit our stride, and I think that with fall coming up, we're going to have a lot of fun new additions to the menu. Yeah. You know, that's another thing. Like, you can get – Cacio Pepe eggs, scrambled eggs with some black pepper, pecorino, great every time. But then you have this overly gluttonous Joe Beef esque <laughs> French bread pudding or uh, French toast style bread pudding <laughs> that you can't. I mean, it's it's almost two pounds in itself. Mountain of whipped cream, beautiful Canadian maple syrup. You know, it's gluttony to the to the to the tea. And then you have something as delicate as a local trout riette. <laughs> with some Ritz crackers and a lemon, you know, like, or a good killed lettuce. So yeah. it's like we're hitting all the marks, yeah. you know, of the, hey, I want to be rambunctious and live life to its fullest. And you get the French toast, the pancakes, the waffles, or you're like, hey, I'm just feeling low key and dainty. And I just want to have a few scrambled eggs and some salad, like all that <laughs> stuff you can do here. And we do it well. We're happy about it. And yeah. everything, we're still sourcing all that stuff local too. Yeah. Like you're, you eating here or us cooking this food is ultimately putting the money back into the ecosystem and the economy for the farms and stuff here, which is, that is important. That is what we're about. Yeah. You know, without them, we don't have a good restaurant. Right. Right. So how would you determine a new, like if you, if you needed something new, Mm -hmm. how would you find the right farmer for it? Well, there's a lot of ways. A people like yourself, yeah. <laughs> it, it, well, I mean, honestly, that's an easy way to start, right? I can, I can get you the lowdown on some horseradish across the river. All day, all day long. All day right? long. Um, but oddly, not oddly enough, I think something that most people don't understand is that farmers are a close-knit community. Even though they're competing against one another, they're also right there next to each other to help each other out. So if I need, like, a specific pepper, like I'm just thinking mm. of something random, a specific pepper grown, and I know that the farmer that I use grows like bell peppers, banana peppers, Anaheim's, but I'm wanting something off kilt. But he may not have the space in his in his, his farm mix. or his right. mix or that particular varietal might need to take something else that they don't have. But they know a farmer down the road that yeah. can do it that's also looking for something to plant. Yeah. So it's like that kind of availability and knowledge that they carry. And honestly, nowadays with social media. You throw something out there, people are willing to give you their opinion on things. So, you know, sometimes good or, good bad. or bad. Yeah, exactly. Like, so the information's there at your fingertips. You just got to know how to find it. Yeah. But the best way is to start, like, start with the farmers. The that network using, that you currently have. The local farmer's market. You yeah. know, Tower Grove is, the, I live over there by that. Go into there, like, all that information's there. It's just you got to ask. Yeah. And they're willing to do it, you know, especially if it gets them in, in the community, in the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. Their publicity helps us, and then we help So do them. you feature the farmers on the menu sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we do. So looking around the, for a menu right now, we're min- sitting at the patio. We're, yeah. we're out on the patio, yeah. and it's pretty quiet, which is why we're here. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we will, like, louden up the entire oh, restaurant if echo. the two of us were inside. We, it would just be bouncing off the Hopefully walls. people just sit around and watch, but you know, <laughs> entertainment. Next time we'll yeah, sell tickets. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the main important part, like, so we're about to start back up with Hawthorne Honey. Um, yeah. They grow local. He's, his name's Scott. We just talked to him yesterday. We're actually going to bring on the Tower Grove area code of his honey. Something that I'd never put in perspective of honey, right? So he taught me yesterday. Learned the zip me. code. Yeah. yeah. So he's locally. like, so he brought in five different zip codes and we landed on the Tower Grove one, specifically 63110. Because the amount of flowers and floral, you can literally smell what it is like walking through Tower Grove, walking through the botanical gardens. Like you smell it <laughs> in the honey, right? And, and Tower Grove smells nice for people who haven't been there. Yeah, I mean, it is actually very <laughs> lovely. To, I walk out there at night It's a all great the time. park in yeah. that area and all that stuff. Yeah, so like little things like that. So on the menu, it'll be like, you know, whatever the menu description with Hawthorne Honey. Yeah. And so it gets them out there. So then next time when people come in, like, oh, that was really good. Where do I get it? Well... Here's Hawthorne the honey. Yeah. Hawthorne honey or Black Hawk Farms doing yeah. the beef or Farmstead Eat Here or any one off farmers that we use, Double Star Farms or yeah. Eckert's Apples. Like, we're happy to promote them because they're the reason why we have such good flavors, such good dishes, such, and we're even open. And you guys 
you're always having these conversations with them because farmers are supplying you on a regular basis anyway, right? Three or four times a week. And I noticed, um, you know, not that I creeped your social media <laughs> or anything, but you may have gone to Eckerd's recently to like yeah, check Saturday. out Eckerd's. <laughs> yeah, went out there. They they asked us out and we did a little pop-up for their hard cider pressing. I guess I'm, first time I've been to Eckerd's heard about it it's like an orchard disneyland it's got everything <laughs> you could want to do at an orchard you know they got their tap room they got their tasting room they got their grocery store <laughs> they got their pumpkin picking they got their apple picking they got all sorts of stuff yeah clothes if you want it you um, missed strawberry picking then because that was way early in i the know season. I see, that's the thing i didn't know about that and then they have pig races come to find out so i will be attending a pig race out there at some time <laughs> Why not, right? He's got this dreamy look in his eye yeah, as he I'm talked like, about pig I races. Like, what if like, it was, I was like the chairperson that got to be the pig caller, you know? The honorary the yeah. calling of the pigs. I mean, I mean hello, you're from Eckers, Arkansas. You I got you. <laughs> you're from Arkansas. Yeah, well, I bet you worked well, on I got that. It. I know how this goes. <laughs> all right. Let's turn a totally different direction because yeah. you and I could talk pretty much all day. It's clear. Um, tell me about the must-haves. Like if, if you're, if you're going to put together herbs, like, Behind you, I'm going to take a picture and put it on the website. Behind you are herbs growing so that I could have fresh herbs in my mm -hmm. meal. Uh, the ones that I personally that I would pick, chervil, mint, cilantro, or not cilantro, chervil, mint, chives, parsley, and thyme. And if you really feeling wild, lemon balm. Yeah, um, I think no that basil. I, you didn't oh, use basil, the word yeah, basil. I, okay, ba <laughs> ba yes, basil is just a, a, a given. I don't ever. Yes, I use too much basil. Probably, I uh, yeah. I'm, I'm like passing. Sorry, out. Gerard. I, I meant basil. I promise. <laughs> and I promised you basil's in there. We have a literally half the garden up top is all basil. <laughs> Thai, purple, opal, all that stuff. All the different kinds of basil. Yeah, yeah. that's just a given. <laughs> um, I try to stay away from rosemary just personally, just uh -huh. because it. It carries such a punch. It has its applications. It does smell and good in your garden. smaller amounts. Yeah. But like thyme, it's your, that gives you your woodiness, but it also can be delicate. Chives, it gives you, you know, that garnishing flavor. It gives you the raw onion flavor. Parsley, well, it's just, you know, it can go in everything, livens things up. It gives you the freshness. Uh, mint has its, I literally will tear mint on everything. And it works well. The, in most the bojito, yeah, <laughs> it really does. I'm not going to lie. Just a little fresh mint goes a long way yeah. on, on everything. Basil again. I basil, thyme, parsley, chives, are and chervil are literally in everything that I cook. Okay. Chervil brings that delicate anise flavor that yeah. uh, most people are unfamiliar with. Yeah. Like it's beautiful to look at. Little bunches of curly little pods of uh, of thing. We don't actually oh. grow it up here yet. <laughs> That's our new next iteration of the garden we'll have you weren't here when enough of the planning was done for the I wasn't, upstairs yeah so yeah. I, I received the, what was planted up there now but i promise you next planting is going to be epic <laughs> of herb proportions <laughs> um but yeah that's that's what i would do i mean and think of also think of lavender lavender is good to have out there a for color but yeah it's a good pollinator so you attract a lot of good bees yeah and other butterflies that pollinate as well like that to me is a perfect like well and lavender lives on year after year yes some of those do and, and some don't some are some don't. You have to keep yeah need to plant every year but think of that like whenever like you're planting something that's what i always try to think is like how can i pollinate have something that's aromatic to also smell mm -hmm. if i'm not using it but also help grow the other herbs that i'm using a lot of right because when you're cutting and growing like you need them to keep continuing but if you don't have any kind of pollination happening around it you're you're only going to use think, them as far as you can. I think fresh herbs is such an easy way to up your home cooking game. Oh, 100%. It's, I Throw mean, away all the dried stuff. Like Far just, too many people overlook it. I mean, dried cinnamon is a good way to go. Yes. You're going to want dried cinnamon, yeah. right? Like there's some of them you're not going to be able to grow depending on where you are. But man, I mean, it makes such a difference if you use fresh spices. But fresh how, herbs. how often is it, and I'm guilty myself, I'm like, all right, I'm making something at home. I don't have a garden yet, but I'm going to go to the store and buy a whole bunch of parsley or one of those little plastic things of basil or mint yeah. or sage or something. Yeah. And I use one out of it and then it just sits in the drawer until, until it rots. Until it goes bad. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot that was in there. Yeah. But if, you have, if you're growing this stuff, you can take what you need. Yeah. But you're also providing something to the ecosystem. Yeah. You know, as far as bees goes and And, and in the planet. winter, you can bring some of them indoors. Inside? Yeah, and then you get just some to look at. Just with a little light. Yeah. Just a little light on it. Yeah. I mean, it, honestly. 
I do. I don't hate having <laughs> plants, especially good smelling herbs in my house. Like, that does not hurt me. Pollinators won't come in the house, hopefully, but <laughs> you know, Depends you'll be fine. You yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah, set them outside on the warmer days. Exactly. Exactly. What about must-haves in the kitchen, like for cooking and things? Where, As far as cooking things go, olive oil is a must for me. Extra virgin olive oil. Really good. Buy buy the best you can, but honestly. You can also use some other stuff just yeah, like whenever. The, the California olive oil that you get at the store is really good. Yep. Good kosher salt. Yep. But really good sea flaky salt. Okay. Like Maldon is the one I use. JD's out of Oregon's a really good one. They do make a really good product. Fresh cracked pepper. I don't use a lot of pepper, but I only finish dishes with it. I mean, how do you not use a lot of I pepper? I don't know. I, one okay. of my nieces is like turning the podcast off. Keep it on, Georgia. It'll get better. <laughs> I think that stemmed from my time with Matt McClure. He okay. he was one of those that was like, "Hey, pepper is a garnish, not a seasoning okay. attribute." Because grow in culinary school, people would really. Oh, yeah. Throw that pepper okay. in there, and then all of a sudden, that's all you taste. You can uh, use it at the end. Yes, it's I do. Okay. Like, I do that's finish okay. the dish with it. Okay. It's not something I just keep in there and everything. Mushroom pellets, if you don't know what that is, it's an Asian, an Asian. Uh, you can get it at Pan Asia. It's like mushroom season. You can get it on Amazon. Yeah. For umami and the it, that's meat, it. Poultry, vegetables. It doesn't matter. Throw a little bit of that in there, and it's wow. Okay. Korean chili flakes are always in my staples. Vinegar. I make my own vinegar, so I have a lot of that around. But if you're going to buy vinegar, like apple cider vinegar is easy to Mm -hmm. have. It's cross. You know, you you can use it on all sorts of things. Rice wine vinegar, use it on all sorts of things. Um, Balsamic. If you're going to buy balsamic, buy the... Buy Modena. (laughs) Splurge. Just do it. Yeah, do yourself a favor. Actually, (laughs) D'Italia here in town, they have a good supply of it. You can walk in there and grab it or get it on there online. Um, Not a sponsor. Uh, (laughs) Just good, uh, but they like little things like that, like acid, lemons, limes, always have those around. Yeah. And if you can uh, have a lime tree and citrus trees in your backyard, good for you. <laughs> I don't have a spot for that or I would. Now I'm thinking about the deck. You know, I could roll it out there on back end. Yeah. They All do right. really good you in the winter. You got me thinking, yeah. And one food for thought, I learned this last year, citrus trees like to grow in pairs. with yeah. Like swans. They like to touch. They like to... <laughs> excite each other and grow and i didn't know mm-hmm. that because i tried to grow a, a lemon tree one year by itself a meyer lemon tree and then a guy that i knocks finale out of birmingham alabama he owns larder foods like which is a purveyor he was like he went out to california learned from Myers a, lemons yeah he learned from a, a an old bonsai tree guy from japan he came over to california and started doing all this stuff and he's yeah. like they want to grow in couples they want to grow they want to touch they want to feel they want to they want to know somebody yeah. else is out there and they said they grow and the next thing i knew i grew i bought two, a pair yeah put them side by side flourished there you go yeah but all no, right. i don't have those trees anymore but <laughs> move too many times yeah they, they, wherever they go they stay wherever i'm at so <laughs> I just haven't had time to get them going here in St. Louis. So, <laughs> All right. So uh, what about tools in the kitchen that you also tools. think everybody uh, needs? Everybody needs a good chef's knife. If you don't know if that, if you don't know what that means, it's the longer, like 8 to 12 inch, one of those, a bread knife, and you're good. Like I truly don't think that you need, like good for you if you want to buy the whole box set knife block thing. That's great, but you'll find that you don't use them all. They look awesome. But just buy a really good knife. Try to buy it from local if you can. Yeah. Somebody that's hand making them. Yeah. Uh, support that so that way you can spend three hundred dollars on a knife and not and get one good one versus, you know, spending a lot of money on other things. Yeah. Um, so bread knife, a chef's knife, a paring knife to do a little small yeah. work, a good set of pans, and you really need probably one stock pot, like yep. a pasta pot, so you can cook pastas or make stock in it. A good. 12 inch saute pan yeah and an air fryer <laughs> get an air fryer i would not have expected a chef to tell me air i need fr- an day, air fryer but long. i got I cook, one so. i literally cook i have a ninja foodie yeah so it's a pressure cooker air fryer sear and all that i i don't hardly cook in pans anymore i literally solely cook out of an that's air fryer. at home yeah as a home cook as a home cook. here you cook in the kitchen I have there's a lots whole of live fire yeah it's too much cast irons i on that note, like I truly believe you need a good set of cast irons. Buy what you can. If you can afford a really good one, buy one. They are heirlooms. They will never go bad. I have my grandmoms. Yeah. 
I have some, like my grandma hasn't given me mine yet because she's like, I well, my grandmother's no longer with yeah, us. Well, so, but I've, I'm happily counting down the days that she stays alive, but also the days that I get the cast iron. I'm really looking forward <laughs> to that. The, the, if those could talk, oh I have God. some video and photos Stories. of Peter Mickelson yeah. who works here. He taught a class on cast iron cooking mm-hmm. over an open flame yeah. next door. There's a the original nonstick. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. And so many people had so many questions for him on like, really, you just wipe it out and then cook something else? And he's like, I do. Mm-hmm. I was only about to say that. I can't tell you how many cast irons I own personally from finding on the sidewalk or people letting go because it rusted. Or, yeah. Or they had gunk on it and they're like, oh, it's ruined. I'm like, that, yeah, I'm glad you think it's ruined because now I get a free cast iron. <laughs> All it takes is a little TLC, just a little salt, rub it with some oil and then bake it, keep cleaning it. Yeah, it's the original nonstick. So when you're done cooking something, wipe it out and keep going. Yeah. Also, I mean, sauces, searing, everything, <laughs> baking in it. I, I, I love cast irons. Oh, like a pineapple upside down cake All in a long. cast iron skillet. So I have a I have a wood fired grill in my backyard along with a little pizza oven. <laughs> but I will literally cook out. If I'm not in the air fryer, I cook outside. Like if I'm off and I'm home yeah. all day, I'll cook a lot of fire out there, and I literally will cook all day long. Nice. My meals Invite me week. over. I'll be happy to come. Absolutely. Theodore's out there. <laughs> All right. Mountain dog. <laughs> I've, I've seen the dog on yeah, the Instagram, he's, too. He's famous in Nashville. Did I forget to ask you something really important about what you're doing here? One of the most important things I think that we're doing here at Bowwood by Niche specifically, um, as you mentioned, Gerard's got a lot of people doing a lot of good things in the group. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that we're really trying to do here at Bowwood specifically is reintroduce what neighborhood dining is, right? What yeah. what is a neighborhood? What does that collective mean? Like what? If what, I lived down the street, I would be here. Yeah, every like day. what? What is like? What does that mean to you? Like what if I like? What is a neighborhood restaurant? That's what we're trying to encompass right now. You know, we have Brasserie just a few streets. I over. love Brasserie. They have oh nailed it man! For the last thirteen years, right, or something like Ugh. that. That they've been going. It doesn't uh, matter what I order there. I'm always oh, so always freaking happy. And you always feel like your family. Like you feel like you belong yeah. there. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What time of day, who you are, you get treated with respect. Yep. You get treated well. Yep. The food's amazing. I literally walk out of there too full all the time. Like, I need to start getting a wheelchair. In the have, bar. Or a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow. Somebody push me around. <laughs> um, but we're really trying to bring the focus of farm to table, mm-hmm. if that's still what people talk about. But celebrating the farmers. Celebrating the neighborhood. Like, what what do people want here? There's this a feeling of community when yes. it comes to the the group yeah like that's what we're that's what we're really trying to strive for and then as far as like the kitchen and staffing goes like we're trying to teach them like what is the like what does it mean to be a neighborhood restaurant what does it mean to be farm to table like why do we support the people we support yeah these younger cooks nowadays you have the instagram you have the food network you have all that stuff they see it as i'm gonna be a chef and i'm gonna be on tv and nothing's horrible and ugly and nasty about the restaurant world (laughs) but in reality it's all ugly and nasty, but it's a beautiful thing. Like we're how, you know, it's like nobody wants to see how the sausage is made. They just want to eat the sausage. So teaching that and learn, teaching the respect of yeah. the ingredients in, in each other. That's yeah. important too. It's like nowadays this world that we live in and not to, like, it's important to be there for one another. And there's no really better way to do that than over a food, over a table, over a drink. Yeah. You know, like that, that's how people. That creation of community is so easy. And I love that you guys also do some like neat pairings with other, other chefs. Yeah. So that's another thing. So like Lauren Nalek and them at Balkan Tree Box. Yes. Love them. We're looking forward to doing a big, uh, so that's another thing. Like we're trying, once October happens and we get settled some more, we're going to start trying to do a lot more chef chef collaborations out here on the patio <laughs> Lily, as you see this is the perfect venue yeah for a chef collab kitchens right there you're smelling the aromas so yeah. we're looking forward to do one with them and a few other restaurants that we've kind of gotten we're in the talks about the dates haven't been set yet but it's like celebrating again celebrating st louis celebrating the community celebrating what we're doing because we all at the end of the day we're all buying from the same farmers yeah we're all doing somewhat the same thing but our own style but when you get to get them together and meld that, like it, it really, we're hey, we're supporting each other. Like you know, they're all the way out there in Webster Grove. We're all out here in the Central. way out there in Webster. It seems like forever, but it's really not that far. <laughs> but you know, for me, it seems like forever. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it's like, but we're here, but we're two different places, but we're doing the, we're in it for the same same reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Happiness, food, farmers. What more could you ask? Fresh food served in like 
incredible ways. Yes. It's perfect. Every day, always changing. <laughs> and like the positive, you know? Yeah. It's like we're growing. Wintertime's right on the corner. You're going to be braised meats. Ooh. Comfort food. What Ooh. makes you happy? Comfort foods, like man. Like right now we have the Sunday, like un- part of the Sunday Fried supper. chicken. Yeah. That's, 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 I get the emails, Zane. I read them all. <laughs> that's, that, well, that stems from my family. That was the Sunday yeah. supper. We did fried chicken and spaghetti every yep. Sunday. Yeah. Or like that was it. You got a leg and a thigh and a big mountain pile of red sauce or gravy or whatever we cooked up and you ate it so that was like my contribution to this is like bringing that like again bringing that neighborhood atmosphere like where do you go for sundays yeah a bunch of strangers coming together eating some fried chicken and mashed potatoes ain't nothing wrong with that if you're not happy then are you ever gonna be happy <laughs> what is wrong with yeah you? i don't I, I don't what yeah I, I, just, I just don't get it i love it Maybe i we love can't it be friends at that you know if that's the case well, before we go, I want to tell people, look you up online. Bowwood by Niche mm-hmm. is the overall for the restaurant. You have your own Instagram. Your own Instagram. But the photos and stuff, if people look at them, they're going to either, if they're in St. Louis, they're going to suddenly want to get themselves motivated and get up. Yeah. Come have brunch. Come have happy hour now. Yeah, happy hour. Two to five dinner, every day. Dinner, lunch. We're finally open seven days a week for dinner. Yeah. So we're open nine to nine every day for your needs of brunch happy hour or dinner get it all figured out this is the place we're just getting started too like you know i finally got my feet wet we're we're grounded the team's excited yeah there's a lot to come and we're just excited to to share it with everybody it means a lot no it It really does it does i can i can absolutely feel the sensation coming out of here oh man just in the smiles like it we're lucky again outdoor kitchen everybody walks by us yeah to come out here to sit on the patio you know you don't know what they're going to expect when they walk out like for the first time seeing them but when they're do- rubbing their bellies on the way out and giving you the thumbs up or high-fiving you i can't tell you how many hugs these line cooks have been getting this week just from you know people coming out here like this so is happy. the best thing i've ever had you yeah know? Whether they mean it or not, it's the, you know, and seeing that hug and it's like total strangers <laughs> hugging another total stranger I love because it. of a bite of food that you cooked for them. That's, that is what we're doing it for. That is why we live. That's what you find at Bowwood by yeah, Niche. absolutely. Perfect. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. I can't wait to, now we got to get this stuff put away so I can come check Explore out all the, the plants. Garden. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here for it. As you heard right there at the end, Zane and I took a chance to go see what they were growing in terms of herbs there on the property, what they were using them for, even what he has plans for next. So I hope you check that out. It'll be on the website, groundedbythefarm.com, and we'll also put it out on social channels. Talk to you again in two weeks. Bye.